Hello to Matha Nation. Welcome once again to our 75th anniversary speaker series. My name is Connor Glowacki, staff member here at DeMatha, and I'm joined today by current staff member Ben Flary, class of 2011, and director of bands emeritus, Dr. John Mitchell, who will be assisting me in conducting today's interview with current director of bands and longtime band instructor and faculty member here at DeMatha, Mr. Jim Roper. Jim is the director of bands here at DeMatha and took over the, after director of bands emeritus John Mitchell retired in 2011. Prior to becoming director, Jim spent 28 years as assistant director of bands and has been at DeMatha since 1982. Jim graduated from the University of Maryland music program in 1980. And after spending one year as director of bands at Archbishop Carroll High School, Jim has been here on Madison Street ever since. Jim is a past president of the Washington Archdiocese Music Teachers Council and has served on the executive boards of the Maryland Band Directors Association and the Maryland Choral Education Educators Association. In addition, Jim has been a member of the conducting staff at the Tidewater Music Festival and conducted the 1991 Maryland Junior All-State Band and has served as a guest conductor of the Southern Maryland Tri-County Honor Band. Jim is also a frequent educator and clinician through the DMV region. In 2015, the Wind Ensemble was chosen to perform for the arrival of Pope Francis at Joint Base Andrews. In 2016, Jim was named Teacher of the Year by the Anne Arundel West County News and was named Veteran Teacher of the Year by the High School's Principal Association in 2019. Jim was also named an Outstanding Educator by Fame, the Foundation for the Advancement of Music and Education in 2020. With that, all being said, it is my pleasure to introduce today's guest, longtime faculty member and DeMatha Director of Bands, Mr. Jim Roper. Jim, thanks for joining us here today. And before we kind of get things started, you, we've been sharing a lot of videos throughout the school year of the various musical, virtual musical performance by our ensembles. So I guess with the COVID-19 pandemic taking place, how hard of an adjustment has it been to teach music virtually this year? Well, Connor, first of all, thank you for having me on. Um, I, I mentioned this to, to Ben and, and Tom Ponton when they first approached me about this. Um, I, I realize that you guys are obviously scraping the bottom of the barrel, uh, to, you know, but uh, no, I do appreciate you, you having me here. Um, and I, to answer your question, it has been a very interesting year. Um, I, when I first started teaching uh, many, many, many years ago, I would have never ever thought that I would be teaching um, from a computer screen. And um, obviously, uh, you know, in 1981, when I first started teaching, uh, laptops didn't even exist. Uh, so it, it's been it's been a challenge this year. Um, but as I said to a number of people, teaching is teaching. Um, you, you find a way to meet the students where they are and then take them beyond where, where they are uh, as best that you can. Um, we, my biggest um, problem was I was not amazingly technologically savvy. Um, I had never used Google Classroom. So it was a lot of on the job training uh, in learning how to do uh, different things. Uh, and uh, one of the first things I wanted to find out was how can we uh, separate out the, the different groups of instruments into you know, basically sectionals. Um, so I was able to, to figure out through Google Classroom how to do breakout groups. Uh, a lot of help from uh, Chris Keplinger and Jim Bradley in the, the Computer Center helping me figure that out. Uh, we were able to set up those uh, breakout groups and uh, they have worked all year long. Uh, they were only supposed to work for 90 days, but they've actually worked all year long. So <clears throat> we were able to, to spend the time um, really um, having the section leaders uh, work with each of the, the sections. Um, so the, the flute section leader uh, was working with his section, uh, going through the parts, uh, clarinet and section leader and so on. Um, and so quite honestly, you know, I would, I would, you know, go in and out of the, the Zoom sessions, hearing what they were doing. I would uh, offer them advice. Uh, the students had, uh, Every Friday night, they had a, a video that was due for, for homework. And so I spent most of my Saturday and Sunday 
listening to the videos and then correcting. It was it was kind of a weird way. You know, when you're in a live rehearsal, you you have immediate response. Here, I, I felt like the students worked for a week. They sent me a video, and then I told them what they did wrong, uh, which seemed kind of backwards, but it, it was kind of the only way um, to, to do that. There was There's absolutely no way you can do a combined, or you can't even put two people together because of the lag. There, there are ways, I, I know people figure these out, but they're incredibly expensive. And um, who, who would have known that, you know, we're still sitting here at the end of uh, the, the calendar, academic calendar, and you're in, we're, we're still in the same basic situation. Um, but we were able to, to do this. Um, we started with Slay Ride in December. Uh, uh, Bruce Kane, who's our recording engineer, um, took this upon him to, we would send him all the students individual videos uh, and uh, they would, and he put them all together. Um, and he, we had what's called a sort of a click track. So I conducted to a metronome, uh, which uh, as most musicians know, they, they, they don't like metronomes. I never liked the metronome when I was a trumpet player because it never followed me. Um, and uh, so, you know, I, to have to conduct to a metronome was not what I wanted to do, but it's what you had to do in order to keep everybody together. Um, so, so I, I would, I would re record myself conducting with the metronome right there. The students um, used headphones or earbuds, and they would listen. And I, we had a, uh, we would count down four, three, two, one, and then one, two, three. Clap on three, rest on four, rest for another measure, and then we would all come in on the downbeat of one. Um, so they were all doing that. They would clap together, and that's what Bruce used to uh, line up all the recordings. Um, uh, the good news is, um, and I probably shouldn't tell this, but uh, he, if somebody was a little bit out of tune or they came in a little wrong place, he had the ability to uh, adjust that just a little bit. So it's, you know, live performances are live performances. You get what you get. Um, here he could make little minor adjustments um, uh, to that. And so he would send me a recording. I would say, okay, I, I, you know, I'm looking for this kind of balance. And that was a good thing because, you know, his idea of, of concept of balance and mine are, are two different things. So uh, I was able to say, well, I'd like to bring out these instruments a little bit more or whatever. So does that answer your question? <laughs> Definitely. Well, and, and it's been great sharing these videos. I, I'm, I know the DeMatha community is a really enjoyed them. They've garnered hundreds and thousands of videos just on YouTube and throughout all of our platforms. So we really appreciate the resilience, resiliency that you and the entire music program here at DeMatha has been able to display this year. Uh, so, so Jim, before, and for everybody who's been on a Zoom before, you know the drill in terms of you, if you want to ask Jim a question, just let us know in the chat bar. Uh, so feel free to start that now. But we're going to ask myself, Ben, and John are going to ask you a quick question. And Jim, I, I want to know, when you started working here at DeMatha in 1982, can you just talk about the growth of the music program since you've been here? Sure. Well, I, I, you know, everyone knows John started the program in 1970, and, and um, you know, he developed uh, more groups as, as time went on. Uh, John Moylan... Uh, met up with him at after a concert in 19 what 80 80 81 john 81. somewhere around there yes yeah and uh and basically said john needed help and john of course took that the wrong way uh um i was at archbishop carroll at the time my first job uh and i had known john for a number of years um and so he was able to uh, I had asked John to come over to Carroll and observe me, make sure I was doing the right things. He would come over, watch my rehearsals. Um, we went to the festival. Um, so he, obviously he was there. John Moylan was there at the festival. Um, and um, John actually, John Moylan actually went to John Mitchell and said, who is this guy at Carroll? You know, and because he was, I think he was, I guess he was impressed with what we did. Um, and then I, John approached me probably in, you know, March of the, the that you know the end of that year and uh asked me if i would be interested in coming over um and he said but you know there's there's one caveat to that and i said okay what and i said well uh you'd have to teach chorus well i never taught for i had been in a chorus since sixth grade uh so it was it was 
it was a lot of trial by fire, I think. Um, but I accept it, obviously. And, and um, so when we when we started, there were three bands, uh, a percussion ensemble, and I started uh, with the choral program. Um, and then then as as we the numbers grew, uh, we we started adding another group. I think we added a symphonic band next. Uh, we, and Mike Gaddy uh, started coming on board, so we started adding percussion ensembles. Uh, we, uh, at some point, um, we started getting more string players with lines of the map, and, and usually we would get a string player, and we would switch them to French horn or oboe or something. Uh, but as we were getting more students, we we felt it was important to start a string program. We had Gene Provine come in, um, and at some point, uh, and I it was in the, the late 90s, as the instrumental program was growing, um, and the choral program was growing, and, and I had Martha von Herman as, as my assistant in the choral program, John looked at me and said, you know, I think it's time you, you make a decision. You know, you got to go choral path, or you got to go the instrumental path. Um, and uh, just, I obviously felt more comfortable with the instrumental. Um, so we, we hired Jim Turk to do the uh, choral program. And so the, the choral students finally got a real choral director uh, and that, that knew what he was doing. And um, so we, uh, from that point, uh, you know, the programs kept growing. Uh, we added a concert band at, at some point uh, in there and hired uh, Matt Bickle to take over the strings and also to work with our concert band. And that's where we are today. Awesome. Thank you, Jim. Uh, before we, we turn it over to John Mitchell, Jim, uh, just had a question. Uh, you know, taking over for someone uh, like John Mitchell, who, uh, like, as you stated, started the music program, um, you know, did you feel any added pressure in kind of trying to live up to those expectations that, that John uh, had set? Uh, and, you know, we were talking a bit earlier. Uh, we had an interview, obviously, with Mike Jones, one of our first Zoom, uh, Zoom interviews. Uh, and I asked him the same question, right, about taking over for someone like like Morgan Wooten uh, and, and if there was any added pressure. So just kind of wanted to get your, your thoughts and, and if you felt like really any pressure uh, to try to live up the, to those expectations. Uh, easy answer is every day. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's been it's been 10 years and absolutely every day. But it's not you know, the, it's not that I feel like I have to live up to. To John's expectations, I, I live up to my expectations, and and my expectations are what John set. Um, but even more importantly, um, I talk, you know, to the students, and to me, this this it's the students and myself uh, as a group that we have we live up to the expectations of the students that represented the wind ensemble and you know all the other groups uh, in previous years, um, and and it's important that. Uh, that they they maintain that standard of excellence through there. Uh, and as you know, I tell the students at, at some point you're going to be a graduate, hopefully, uh, you know, of Damatha, and then we will be the rest of us left will be beholden to you to keep up the standard that you had. Uh, so yeah, there's there is that pressure um, in there, but it's it's not only just you know, to John, but, but also to the students who um, set that standard. Awesome. Uh, John, you want to go ahead and ask your question? Sure. First of all, it's great to see you, John. It's great to see everybody else here, too. Uh, <clears throat> these are wonderful. I thank Ben and Connor for doing these. Uh, they're amazing. I've been able to see quite a few of them. Uh, yeah. Uh, I just wanted to congratulate you a little math. It's almost 40 years now that he's been at the math. And uh, that, you know, that's incredible. And <clears throat> during those years, of course, you've honed your skills as, a, as an educator and you uh, have uh, different techniques and different uh, uh, methods to meet the challenges of every day in a, in a classroom and in rehearsals. And, and Jim has done that very well and been very successful. It's been very, uh, I've been very proud to uh, come sit and relax during uh, the Matha concerts. Uh, it's, it's been great. Uh, 
<laughs> and uh, the, the standard is, is upheld, and that, that's great to see. But then, you know, you get to almost 40 years of teaching, and you you have a set idea of what you're going to do, and then all of a sudden, and I'm going to go back to the COVID thing, the COVID hits, and uh, you almost have to start over. And uh, I, I was so happy that I was not teaching during this time, but I've been watching, and I've been talking to Jim, and... Uh, a couple of other band directors, a couple of them I see here. Uh, Peter, one, Peter Holzberg, he's up in New York. We've talked a couple of times. Uh, but uh, you just you had to start over. And I've been very, very proud of the Wind Ensemble and all the groups at the Mata. And you, know, you mentioned the videos. I was going to mention that, the virtual videos. If you haven't seen those, you should do that. And, and I know just all the, uh, all the challenges of... Uh, 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 you know, just trying to keep the kids engaged and also trying to help them improve and their musical skills. So I've been very happy to see that. And I think those videos are, are a good result of that. But uh, I was just wondering now that we're coming out of the, hopefully we're coming out of this nightmare and by September we'll be back to some kind of normalcy. Has there been any, Jim, has there been any positive aspects of this 14 or 15 months that we've been under this cloud. Uh, anything that you're doing new now that you might take forward in, in your teaching? I, yeah, I think absolutely. Um, one of the things that I, um, um, you know, when I, we talk about the videos the kids had to turn in, um, that is something that, that I'm uh, going to continue doing. Um, in order to, because I think, right, what I found this year is when the kids have to use a metronome and they have to stand up on their own two feet by themselves. And John, you know that, that this is why we push students to do a uh, solo fest, because there's nothing better than somebody having to do their own solo. And because you're either, you know, you can't depend on anybody else. Um, and, and so, these videos have forced the students to um, to really make sure that they they have their parts down. Um, and I, I learned this after uh, the the sleigh ride, um, which I was really happy when I when I first heard it. Um, and uh, it, it's sort of I, John. I'm sure you and every other band director out there can think that when you hear your first concert of the year in November or December, you go, oh, that was really good. And then you hear it in, in May and you go, I can't believe I put that on stage. Uh, it's sort of, the, that, sort of that same idea. Um, I, but I did learn from that in that, you know, I would say, okay, play from letter A to E on your video. They would do that. I would send them back comments and say, you need to, to work out this rhythm, work out that, blah, blah, blah. And then they would send in the next video from E to H and okay, send it blah, blah, and then H to, H to the end. And then when they sent their final video, none of the stuff was fixed. I mean, they just, they didn't do anything and they just let it go. And uh, so I, I knew from that point, well, we've got to change that way. So after, if they sent me something that wasn't correct, I sent it back to them and they had another three or four days to re return uh, the video, corrected video. And we kept that going until they finally got it right. Um, and so that aspect of it, yet yeah, I've, I've learned. And so it's it's more, there's a lot of individual um, work that has to be done. Uh, I do plan on keeping that that aspect of the, the plane going. Um, and um, I think um, now there was something else and it just went out of my head. But, uh, I, but I, I do like the... The ability to have um, sort of these Zoom meetings. We had a uh, our WAMTC, the Archdiocesan organization. We had a we had a meeting yesterday um, with all the band directors and, and the uh, archdiocese, and we talked about our September meeting. We said, do we want to have it in person or another Zoom meeting? And yeah, we're, we're going to have a Zoom meeting because it, it seems to work out better. I think parent teacher conferences would work better in this setting because rather than parents having to take off work to um, come into DeMatha and they walk through the door and sometimes you look at a parent and you go, I know who this is, but I can't remember who you are or who your son is. Um, I was able to prepare 
ahead of time by knowing who had signed up for the meetings. And so I could, I could get right to the, the nitty gritty of, um, you know, what the problem was with their son, what they needed to work on or, or whatever. Um, so I, I think there have been some good things that, that have come out of this. Um, I, I can't wait till we can start, hopefully, uh, start playing in the fall and, and uh, with, with the 11 year olds and up being able to be vaccinated. Um, I, I feel that, that we should be in, in good shape to be able to, to do that. Um, and by the way, a uh, little plug, our, our Kaleidoscope concert is scheduled for October 16th. So um, hopefully that will uh, be there and, and um, uh, on that date. And we'll look forward to having you guys all there. Thank you. Thanks, John. Uh, Jim, before we go to our first question from our audience today, I want to relay a comment from Nathan Miller. He wanted to tell you guys this directly, but he's in a meeting right now. So he wanted me to relay this message on. He wanted to thank you and Mr. Mitchell for some of his fondest memories from his high school years at the MAFA. And he thinks of them very fondly. So he just wanted to thank you both uh, for, for all the memories there. Um, and we'll go to our first question from Michael Way. So Michael, go ahead and um, your mic. Hey there, Mr. Roper, it's good to see you. Class of 98, go Stags. Uh, alto saxophone in concert band two and symphonic. Um, I have two quick questions, if you don't mind. Uh, one is I picked up random favorite composers from studying under you and Mr. Mitchell. Mr. Mitchell, I will forever love Gustav Holst and particularly Mars. And from you, uh, I have a soft spot for John Philip Sousa. Uh, from playing Gladiator, uh, and I'm the only dude like just randomly listening to Sousa when it's not a national holiday, which is <laughs> weird. And so I'm curious, do you, after all these years with music in your head, who stands out as uh, one or two of your favorite composers? That's my first question. Um, well, I, I'll uh, since you had me in Contraband Two and Symphonic Band, I'll categorize my my composers by that. Um, absolutely, my my favorite composer of that um, level is would have been uh, Claire Grunman. Um, I, I'm I'm I love programmatic music, um, and I mean that's one of my favorite things. And and he did a lot of the folk rhapsodies, um, and uh, there was a lot of stuff that you could do uh, musically with. He he wrote exceptionally well. Um, he crossed voices, so if you didn't have certain instruments, you could cover it with another instrument. Uh, he was definitely one of my favorite composers. Um, and John Zedeklik uh, was another. Um, uh, now for wind ensemble, uh, I think probably, uh, obviously Vincent Persichetti, uh, I, I guess it was 2019 to 2020, for the year that we ended up going out of the pandemic. Um, I was trying to think of, we were trying to think of pieces, I was going to think pieces for the spring. And uh, so I had put a lot of stuff out on the, the students' folders. And one of my students said, you realize this is the fourth year in a row that you put out Vincent Persichetti. Uh, <laughs> no, no, I didn't. But, you know, so Vincent Persichetti, Gustav Holst, obviously um, phenomenal uh, composers. Um, those, those probably stand out. Do what you love. Um, my second question is one of my major memories coming home after a band concert was my dad who used to spend his youth as a roller skating DJ. He was remarking on your rhythm. He said that man can move up there. <laughs> <laughs> and it got me wondering, do you dance? And if so, what do you dance to when no one's around? <laughs> I'll, I'll ask my wife, do, Leslie, do I dance? <laughs> no, I don't. <laughs> I, 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 when, you know, if we go to weddings or whatever, and there's a man, I, I'm incredibly self-conscious about <laughs> my dancing abilities. And no, I, I, if I do any dancing, it, you know, it must be on the podium. That must be the only time that I dance because, uh, no, I, I don't dance at all. The metronome has nothing on you. No, no, it doesn't. 
Awesome. Thank you. Thank you for your great questions, Michael. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you. Uh, we'll go to uh, Dennis Yogori. Dennis, go ahead and ask your question, please. Sorry, you're on mute, Dennis, by the yeah, way. There got you go. It. There we go. Okay. Okay, uh, Mr. Roper. Uh, when it's safe once more to resume face-to-face -face, uh, uh, classes that back there, uh, are there any plans for the Wind Ensemble and the music program to compete in Toronto, Canada uh, once more? <laughs> Uh, interesting, Dennis, coming from you. Obviously, you <laughs> remember the, the story behind it. John's laughing. Should I tell the story or not? I'm cool with it. <laughs> I think the last time, and John, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but the I last think time... Ben, you, I think Mr. Ben has an idea what's going on. I don't know. The no, last I, time, I, I approve. I approve. Go ahead. Yeah. The last <laughs> time we went to Toronto, um, uh, Dennis was my Ooh. first year clarinet player. Was it was it symphonic band or concert band now? Concert band two. Okay. Concert band two. And um, uh, he had a major solo in one of the pieces. And uh, we and Dennis, you know, he's he's uh, in the Philippines, and um, and so he had all the the proper cards, just you know this and that, blah blah blah. They went to the Canadian embassy. Uh, and his aunt and uncle went to the Canadian embassy. Yes, this is all you need. We get to the border, and the border patrol officer walks on the bus, and we'd already told the student to be very quiet, be respectful, blah, blah, blah. Dennis, um, uh, we come down there. Dennis is sitting across the aisle with me, and the, the border patrol officer tries to, you know, ease our tension, make a joke, and the kids wouldn't laugh, which is good. Uh, and um, and so he says, is, there, is everybody a U.S. citizen? And Dennis raised his hand. Okay, sir, come up, come with me. So he's in there, and I, I went with him, and we're sitting in there, and all of a sudden, uh, one of the Border Patrol officers says, well, you don't have the proper um, what was, what was an identification, a proper whatever documents, passport to get into Canada. And I said, well, what do you mean? And, you know, he, they, were, they, were, they were told they needed this. Nope, that's not good enough, uh, so we can't let you in. I said, well, no, 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 you have to let him in. He's got a solo tomorrow. And so they, they were, well, I'm sorry. So long and short story is they, they um, basically um, charged us a astronomical fee. Uh, and they said, we can let you in with a fee, but it's getting back across the border. I guess they didn't want it, Dennis, you, they didn't want you to stay there in Canada. Uh, but we paid some fee. We were able to get him in, you know, back and in the bus and over. He played phenomenally. And uh, I, I think that was the year I really lost all my hair. Uh, but uh, I, could, so, I couldn't imagine the stress levels you were going through back then, Mr. Roper. But well, I could never forget that 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 part of my life. Process. And Mr. Mitchell as well. Everybody in the band program, <laughs> and Matt was there too. <laughs> well, the, the answer to the question is no. We're not going to Toronto anymore. <laughs> okay. Uh, and mainly because um, they they. They have changed the regulations. It used to be you could have a driver's license, um, but yeah. now you have to have a passport. Passport. So uh, right. no, we're not we're not going to Toronto. I, I was okay. I was definitely scarred by that incident. <laughs> <laughs> not your fault. <laughs> I know. <laughs> All right, that's that's it. Thank you, thank you, thank you, <laughs> thank you for being a great part of my life, guys. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Dennis, thanks for your question. Dennis, you said it's midnight where you are. So did, I know Jim, I think you mentioned uh, the Philippines. Is that correct? That's correct. Yes, that's correct, sir. Yeah. Thank you for joining us. We really appreciate you taking the no time. Problem. No problem. There. Um, we're going to toss it over to Jim, uh, one of your colleagues here at DeMath in the music department, Matt Bickle. Can you muting? <laughs> Is it true, Mr. Roper and Mr. Mitchell, that you guys left somebody in Canada? He almost uh, left him, missed a bus or something? Yes, I can answer that because he was on my bus, I think. Uh, no, actually, he wasn't on your bus. That's the problem. <laughs> but, I, mean, we, we, uh, I mean, we school the kids quite a bit about uh, being on time, and if you're not on time, you maybe left. So we're about three blocks away from some museum in Niagara Falls, I think. And somebody said, I think we're missing somebody. And uh, when we found out who it was, we were just going to go ahead anyway. But it was <laughs> Matt, Matt Bickle. And he was running toward trying to get to the bus in, in Niagara Falls. So uh, 
Probably the only time he was late in his life. Oh, I've never been late since. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> he was a lot thinner too back then, so he was running all right. I was, well, yeah. He was running. Thanks, Mike. Um, <laughs> so uh, w- one of the things about the music program that uh, I think helped make it successful is the idea that, uh, that John and Jim had of bringing in private instructors in and having our kids study uh, privately. Um, my oldest son is a junior there and plays French horn. And, um, and then my, my, my second son, Jake, is, uh, plays alto saxophone. I tried for four years to talk him out of it, but he's just, he's adamant that he's going to play alto saxophone. And it got me to thinking about what an unbelievable teacher we had in Chris Vidala. And it would be, I would so wish that Jake could take lessons with Chris and it kind of, you know, hits me a little bit that that Jake's time now is he'll be a freshman and and, and he could be down in the practice room with Chris O'Dowell I didn't know if Jim or, or John maybe you could talk about Chris a little bit and or maybe about how the uh, the impact of having private teachers has affected the program well John you want to go ahead because you, you started the, the private lesson program thing yeah well yeah there's nothing I don't think there was anything that uh, takes the place of a fine musician and a student being together. And I think probably everybody on this page here that I see that was in the program took lessons and I'm sure you know the benefits of that. Uh, But Chris, yeah, we we got Chris because one of his other, uh, one of our other teachers was leaving and he recommended Chris. And after some misunderstandings, we got Chris to come over. And uh, I mean, he was the consummate teacher and the consummate uh, professional player and uh, you know being able to play an instrument well is an art and being able to teach well is an art and just because you can do one doesn't mean you do the other and he's one of those few people that could do both and just uh, one of the most humble guys ever and uh, of course we lost him a couple of years ago and uh, he, he had a huge impact I mean he was as important as any other faculty member on the program, I see Eric Cooper and maybe yeah, I haven't, I can't see everyone here, but I know Eric. You took lessons from Chris? Yes. And uh, so, I mean, you know, he was very, very, very important. And all of our private teachers, we've had some great private teachers, a lot of uh, professional musicians, a lot of service musicians, uh, and symphony orchestra musicians. And there's nothing that takes the place of private instruction, I, I feel. Absolutely. Awesome. Thank you, John, and and thank you for the question. Uh, We're going to go to, uh, let's go to Jeff, uh, let's see, Jeff Newman. Jeff, if you want to unmute your mic and ask uh, Jim a question. Got it. Okay. I'm Jeff Newman, a tuba player from class of 85. So that means I was there when Jim first uh, came in the 82. I believe I was in your first band. And so I was just saying, I, I love the, the current facilities are beautiful. They're very, very impressive. I'm very glad to have been able to see them with the alumni band and, and play there briefly and all that. It's all very nice, but tell the truth, doesn't just a little bit, don't you miss that little trailer we were in when you started? Well, to tell the truth, we set this band room to be like the trailer in terms of the acoustics. All right. Um, we, I mean, we, the, the band room and the, and the trailer was so dead. Students had to actually work really hard uh, to, to produce a good sound, produce good articulations, everything. And there was nothing left on, I mean, to the imagination in that, in that trailer. Um, and then when we moved to our new facility down below the library in uh, 1990, 91, whatever that was, um, we, you know, they, they set it up and it was too perfect. It was like being on a stage, which is great for performance, but not great for rehearsing. And it hit a lot of the things. The students didn't have to work as hard to produce a sound. Um, we didn't know that until the very first performance. And, and we felt, oh my goodness, where did the, you know, what happened to the power uh, of, the, of the groups? And um, so we had to make some adjustments, not only to the room, but to our ears. And that's the hardest thing is trying to convince a student not to believe what they're hearing. They have to believe what they're not hearing. Um, and so when we moved, when we started designing this facility, 
um, we went with to the acoustic engineer and we said, we want this as dead as possible. And, and John can tell you, the, they try to talk us out of it all the time. I mean, every, are you sure you want it? Yes, this is what we want. And, um, and so now we're back to being able to uh, hear a group of kids are having to work harder uh, to put air through their horns to articulate correctly. Um, so th that was a, I mean, it was not a great place, but the, the acoustics were perfect for what we wanted. We made magic out there. So we don't, we don't need this fancy stuff like the kids today. We, we just need a little building out back and leave us alone. It was well, and, and we're not far physically, we're not far from where that trailer was. Sure. So some of that magic may be transferred over. Good deal. Thanks, Jeff, for your question. Uh, Jim, I think we had a question from Stephen Miller. So Stephen, if you wanna unmute your mic and ask your question. Actually, Connor, he actually just got an email for Stephen. He said he yeah. lost connection. Uh, but here's his, here's his question, Jim. He said, um, could you ask Mr. Roper how he thinks a return to in-person rehearsals and concerts will go in terms of how long they, they will think it will take to retrain the eyes to look up? That was his question. Um, and again, I can throw this back. I won't throw it back to John, but John would agree with me and Peter Holzberg and all the vendor. They don't look up at us anyway. <laughs> right. they, they never look at us. <laughs> and uh, I, I don't think it's going to take long. Um, I think the probably the hardest thing is getting their ears working um, for everybody else to listen um, to each other. And, you know, Matt, you know, I, I think you and I, have, we've talked about this. How, how do we get them to hear each other as an ensemble again? Um, if you think about a, a football team, you know, if you are the, the guard and you're practicing, you know, everything, you're exactly what you're supposed to do on the field and the plays, but now you have 11 people around you on your side, 11 people on the other, things change. So it's going to be, it's going to take some adjustment. Um, I, I would hope it's not going to take, you know, more than a day, uh, but I think that's, <laughs> but uh, hopefully it won't take that, that long. That's great. Um, Jim, I think we have a question here from Tim Bowen. Uh, so Tim, go ahead and unmute your mic. Yeah, I appreciate that. Um, yeah, um, the question I had was, for me coming into the, to the band program, uh, I, I was pretty much forced in from my parents to play. And then, I, but then after a while, I started to enjoy it and, uh, um, and transition from trumpet to euphonium. And then being offered scholarships and stuff like that. So I was wondering how, like, how intentional was that with the culture uh, creating that excellence that you, you always provide, but then also with that fun. I mean, how intentional was that as you develop the program? So, so I, the question is, how how do we develop in the culture of just the um, band? I think number one is is you have to put the students first. I mean, that's why we're all here. Um, uh, you know, we're we're here for the students, and we're here to. Um, help the students uh, enjoy music, and and you're you're not the only person who has walked through these doors whose parents said you are going to be in the band at least one year, um, and um, and then the whole idea is to get you to understand that there's there's beauty in music that maybe you didn't experience um, in your elementary or middle or junior high or whatever, um, and that there is. Um, I, I think John, John said, you know, years ago, the first thing he did after the very first year was split into two groups. So you have competition. And, and so guys are, are typically competitive. So the, the whole idea is to get them to want to improve and get better uh, so that they can be in the, in the wind ensemble. Um, and that sort of for 28 years, that was what my I felt like my job was to, as the uh, assistant director was to have people ready to go up to that top group. Um, and so it's just, it's a matter of, of trying to, to get them to um, really buy into what you you have and um, uh, have them love music. Does that answer your question? Yeah, that's perfect. Yeah. Okay. I appreciate it. Sure. Thank you. It's good to see you.
Yeah, good to see you. Yes. Also, I graduated in 95, uh, Euphonium. Went down oh, I remember. Yeah, I remember. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> thanks, thanks, Tim, for your question. Jim, we're, we're going to have a few more questions here before we wrap it up. So we actually just got a question in here from Frank Pesci. So Frank, go ahead and unmute your mic. Well, hey there, Mr. Roper. Frank, how are you? 92, I'm great. Welcome. Uh, hello from Germany, where I'm dialing in. Sorry, I was a little late. I see some other people here. My question is this. Coming up in your bands, I um, was introduced to um, many of the musical principles which still form the foundation for the work I'm doing today. But one of the things that I'm really appreciative of is the emphasis that you gentlemen put on um, programming 20th century works. Percy Ketty, um, Ives, uh, John Barnes Chance, all these things that put those kinds of tonalities in our young little ears. And I'm wondering if that was a particular choice. Was it something that you guys did to get an edge in competitions? Was there a educational aspect to it that you were specifically trying to accomplish? Um, that's what I want to know because it's your fault uh, now. <laughs> I've got all those sounds in my head. <laughs> well, so that's it. You don't want to ask. Well, I think the, the, the general idea is, is you want our students to play, no matter what level they're at, we want them to play quality literature um, and, and to expose them to, to different ideas. But um, I think every director um, knows the strengths and weaknesses of their group and you plan for uh you you pick a piece that's going to hide your weaknesses and bring out your strengths um some years it's you know it, it's first getty some years it might be Hindemith, some years it might be del joyo uh it could be you know so you're you you want them to especially as you get into the you know the level of wind ensemble there's so much really fine music that you want them to, um, to experience. Um, and um, that's sort of, you know, where, where I come from. That's great. Thank, thanks, Jim. And Frank, thanks for your question. Joining us from Germany. So we had a Dennis from the Philippines, Frank from Germany. It shows Damatha and Damatha music is really an international. So we appreciate you guys stopping in. Uh, Jim, I, so I have a question here. Do you have a favorite piece of music in terms of your conducting career that you've gotten to experience with the students here at DeMatha? Uh, I, I was thinking about that. And, and I mean, I love all the, the music, um, but if I had to choose one for the, the concert band to symphonic band, it would be um, Irish Rhapsody. Um, I, I, just, I, I just find that piece to be a gorgeous, a Claire Grunman piece. Um, and then um, for Wind Ensemble would be um, Sketches on a Tudor Psalm. I, I've loved that piece ever since I played it in high school. Um, and I, I was had the opportunity uh, to conduct it once with our Wind Ensemble here. Uh, and then uh, probably for, um, when I taught chorus, Probably my, my favorite pieces were either um, the sea chanties uh, or the spirituals. Uh, I, I, I love uh, both of those. I, I think of the sea chanties as being typical um, men's chorus type of, of tunes. I, I mean, obviously there's a lot more. And spirituals because they just, they speak to me. Awesome, thanks Connor. Uh, and just wanted to again, thank everyone for your, for your fantastic questions. Uh, today, Jim, I'm going to close with this question. Um, just wanted to ask, you know, what, what DeMatha means to you um, and how you think it stands out uh, from other high schools in the country. I, I like to ask this kind of to, to all of our uh, Zoom guests, you know, you, you're coming up on your 40th year, uh, you know, John Mitchell, uh, Morgan, I mean, there's so many DeMatha faculty and staff that spend so much time here. Um, and, you know, I, I, I obviously I've only been here, uh, this is my fifth year, but I'm starting to kind of see you know why that is, but just wanted to ask you kind of what 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 does the math mean to you, and how does how do how do you think it stands out from from other high schools in the country? Um, well, first of all, you keep bringing up I'm coming up on my 40th year, and you know Jeff mentioned that you know we started the math the same year 
Uh, I'm actually only three years older than Jeff. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. although that's Jeff, that's getting kind of old too. Uh, so, um, I, what do I see about the math? I, I think to me, um, the one thing that, that um, I've experienced at, at the math is there's, there's not um, one person or group or activity or athletic team or musical group, whatever, that doesn't expect to be the best. Um, and, they, and, you know, the, how you, you know, you might start a group, and I think of the crew team and how uh, I think it was Mr. Reed started the, the crew team here years ago and what it's become now. Uh, and uh, I think the expectation is if you start a, uh, anything at the map, whether it's a club, the, the uh, audio club or the gaming club or whatever, the expectation is you're going to be the best. And and the other thing I that I see at the map is there's no um, there's no putting down. You know, the students are, are don't you know, say, oh, this group is better than this group. Well, you're in that group, blah, you know, you're, you know, you're, you're a loser or whatever. I've, in 40, 39 years, I've never heard that from a student. Um, and the, to that, you know, that's credit to the students um, who, who really embrace what everybody does. Um, you know, in a lot of schools, um, you know, if you're in the, you're in the band, uh, you're, you're one of those bandies or whatever. And you know, if you're an if you're an athlete, oh, you're just the most wonderful thing in the world. I, I've never felt that to be part of it. And I think in terms of the band and athletics, it's because 75% of our musicians are also athletes. So it's not it's like the athletes that they're going to pick on bands. They're going to pick up their pick on their own guys. I, I've never felt that here. And and I think that is a, one of the the greatest things um, to to be here. Is it's the student body? It's the attitude of the students. It's the uh, the dedication of the faculty and the staff uh, here, and and how everybody uh, wants to succeed. They want to be the best. Well, Jim, thanks for thanks for joining us again. I mean, to to put it lightly, the contributions from yourself, John Mitchell, Matt Bickle, Mike Gaddy, Carlos Castrillon, and Coach Turk on the choral side continue to keep the math and music at the top throughout the country. So we really appreciate, you know, all the hard work that you guys have put in throughout this time. And Jim, just thanks again for joining us today. We really appreciate it. Before we go, I want to toss it back over to Ben for a message from our advancement office before we let everybody go. Before you toss it, Ben, just thank you guys for all being here. Uh, appreciate it. It's great to see these faces. And, um, you know, I, I, uh, I see Sean Pointer, you, you popped up, you know, uh, let's, let's get that, you know, beard shaved, uh, get in, get, get a uniform. You know. I'm taking after Mr. Mitchell. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you all for being here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, Jim. Thank again. Thank you, man. You're, you're a true DeMatha legend and, and DeMatha is very lucky to have you. So just thank you again for, and thank you everyone else for your, for your great questions. This, is, this has been awesome. John Mitchell as well uh, for helping to moderate. Uh, so just as we conclude, Again, we'd like to ask for everyone's support uh, for the Fund for DeMatha, which is critical to the school uh, in support of our ongoing mission of educating faithful gentlemen and scholars. Uh, you can always give online at www.dematha.org uh, or by mail. Um, any questions, you know, you can feel free to, to contact me, uh, Ben Flair. So again, thank you guys so much, uh, Jim. Uh, and thank you, John, and everyone else for, for joining us this week. You guys can are the I, best. Can I, can I put in a plug on that? Of course, thank of course. If you'd like to uh, donate to the music program, that would be great. The Lawrence Scholarship Fund uh, does help our students uh, with private lessons. And uh, I don't know what tuition was when you guys uh, went here years ago, uh, but it's close to $20,000 now. Um, so any kind of help uh, you can give to the Lawrence Scholarship Fund or the John Mitchell Scholarship Fund that also um, helps uh, us be able to get uh, students uh, with uh, tuition aid. So um, I'm not taking any money away from anybody else, but, uh, you know, sorry for that plug. <laughs> no, of course. Thank you. Apparently, Charlie Kenny said it was $425 when he was here. So that's, no. it's, it's a little more expensive now. So, But thank you, Jim. And thank you, everyone else. Uh, and we'll see you next time. Thanks, guys. Thank Thanks you. Much.